Hey everybody, welcome to Cars with Cocktails, a show where we join two things that go perfectly together, drinking and driving. I am your host, Paul Barrett, joined by my co-host, Charles, aka The Hum Mechanic, and uh, we're going to be drinking and talking about car salesmen today. <laughs> uh, car salesmen, one of my favorite topics, and despite the fact that I think everybody thinks that I'm just going to straight slay car salesmen, which there is a period in time where that will happen, uh, I'm actually not as down on them as as a lot of people are. Uh, you know, it's it's like anything. Some are great and some are terrible, and most fall in between. But before we talk about said car salesman, the drink of the day, uh, I have forgotten the name of it, of course. Cause Tom I, Collins. How do I like? That's one of those iconic drinks that I actually don't think I've ever had. Which it's got some of my favorite things uh, in it. Um, so yeah, this is gin, lemon juice, club soda, and simple syrup, if I recall correctly. Uh, yeah, so it is, according to the recipe I'm looking at here, two ounces of gin, three quarter ounce lemon juice, half an ounce of simple syrup, uh, two fluid ounces of club soda. All right, well, I have all of those things. I switched up the gin today. This is called Conniption. And it's a local Durham, North Carolina distillery. So that, it might be awesome. It's also hard to open. Uh, and I did not pre-cut my lemons today, but I still <laughs> have to juice them. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's that. And I also threw in a little piece of flair into the simple syrup, which is in this cup right here by adding some fresh ginger. So that might be awesome or it might be terrible. I don't know. It may completely ruin the uh, the spirit of the drink and uh, trigger the Tom Collins purists out there, but that's okay because, you know, it's cool. I also have never had a Tom Collins. And to me, one of my endeavors in this entire thing is to try drinks that I've always, I'm, I'm familiar with the name of, but... I've never had before, and Tom Collins would be one of them, which is why I selected it for this week. Well, I think you did a fine job on that one. Uh, I am going to, <laughs> I'm going to slice up a lemon real quick and uh, see how long it takes me to squeeze. How much? How much lemon juice did you say I, I need to? <laughs> three, three, <laughs> three cups of lemon. Three juice. quarter fluid ounces. All right, I think I can do that. I think I can do that. Did you, how, how are you lemon juicing? Oh, fun fact. Someone pointed out on our last episode that I was complaining I had nothing to stir with as I had a cup with a spoon essentially right there. So, um, <laughs> I like some, that. Sometimes, oh, there's already a seed in there. My lemons are, are the Harris Teeter uh, bottled variety of lemons. Ah, you uh, made the smart play. I think I got all the green uh, grasshopper juice off of my laptop, though, since our the, since last we spoke. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear. Oh, geez, this is just making them. All right, I'm not gonna measure the lemon juice. I'm just going right in and just, look at all the seeds that are going in there. Oh, that is a that lot of delicious. seeds. That yeah, good. that'll be a crunchy Collins here. Uh, <laughs> all right, now I have this lemon with. I need to do something. It, this should be how to not make drinks. <laughs> Dude, I mean, <laughs> this is a disaster. <laughs> if I were a Smartra man, uh, I would have a better setup here. However, I normally, so fun fact also, I normally have my laptop and everything on that little green rolly cart that you can kind of see that's piled up with crap over there, but it's piled up with crap over there, so I didn't use it. And I'm on my like my little work <laughs> my little workstation. So now I have a choice to make. I can continue making this giant mess that I have, or I can spoon. I, I forget how much a half ounce of uh, a simple syrup. Half this ounce. this tiny much at a time, just like I don't know that much at a time to measure it out. Or I, I can risk this. I'm going to risk the spill. You've already just winged the entire process thus far. I don't even know why you would even consider doing what you just said. I don't know. Oh, that's way too much. That's an ounce. And more seeds. Good God, man. All right. I'm committing to, ne <laughs> I'm committing to next week 
to, I'm looking for like a, someone to help me. There's, there's no one here to help you, Charles. <laughs> and uh, okay, and since I have the memory of a stump, how much club soda was it? Two ounces. Two ounces. Two ounces gin, two ounces club soda. I had to look too, by the way, so just to okay. be clear. And uh, that is one and a half. Most normal people would measure one and one. I am just going to, well, oh, Lord. All right, well, to be fair to the Tom Collinses is out there, uh, if this is terrible, it's my fault because I made it like an asshole. Yes, uh, so fun fact. Well, let me, let me pull this up because... I, I was curious when with a name like Tom Collins, you're like, oh, that's a curious name. I wonder what the origin of said drink is. Like who was Tom Collins, the who man? was the Tom myth, Collins? The legend. So the story goes that the Tom Collins drink was named after the great Tom Collins hoax of 1874, where something would happen where people would go into bars and tell other people that somebody by the name of Tom Collins was essentially talking shit. I'm sure that's not the words they would have used in 1874. Uh, I wish I knew something interesting to say at this point. That would be a hilarious way that somebody used to talk, but I don't have that. Uh, and then, then somebody stole somebody else's drink recipe called the John Collins and published the name the Tom Collins in a drink recipe book. I feel like there one that's either completely made up, just a total like drunk dude bro bar story. Um, or I don't know, like it's kind of cool if that's really what happened. I don't quite like I'm trying to like put myself in the position of you're sitting at a bar and somebody comes up and like, hey, Tom Collins is talking crap about you. And then like all right. <laughs> what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in, in 1874, one would have to defend their honor. Ah, they're not duel. used to, <laughs> they're not used to people talking shit on them on the internet all day long. <laughs> I guess our scope is a little bit different than perhaps a hundred and, uh, you know, 40 some odd, some odd years ago. Uh, so have you tasted your Tom Collins yet? I have. And what are your thoughts? I find it to be uh, refreshing and uh, okay. It's a, it, it has a very similar, uh, what, was, what was the gin and tonic? No. Was it gin uh, last tonics? week was a vodka fizz. The very gin similar drink. Basically the same thing just with vodka instead of gin. Yes, but this almost has a very similar taste to the gin and tonic to me because gin and tonic was gin, tonic water, and then lime. So this has a very gin and tonic slash club soda and then citrus added to it. So they're kind of, I feel like the last three drinks we've had are basically the some variation of the same drink. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It's not bad. I feel like if I was in the mood for this, I would probably just get a gin and tonic because lime is so much better than the poor, sad lemon um, I apologize for the lemon for it being so terrible compared to a lime, but I think I would just go with the gin and tonic because lime is delicious. And, but yeah, otherwise, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not mad at it at all. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, car salesman, I, I was kind of, uh, brought upon this topic mostly because I saw somebody saying, I can't exactly recall of something about a bad experience with product knowledge around a, a car sales experience. Um, and I replied with saying that, uh, pretty much as a general rule, it, when you go to a dealership, a car salesman has the least amount of knowledge of those cars as anybody in the building. The, the guy who cleans the toilet may or may not have more product knowledge than the car salesman himself. I, I agree with that. But I, what I want to say before we kind of venture down this path if you are listening to this and you are a car salesman and you're like, these dudes are assholes. I know all the stuff about cars and all the stuff about my product. Then what you also know is you're the exception. And you also also know that Paul's 100% right. 
And when he says that, take yourself out of that position for one moment and think of your colleagues that if you opened the hood, wouldn't be able to point to the air filter on the car. You might know all that stuff, but you know, you know that most people don't. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with it. You're, you're kind of uh, warning ahead of time. And I, I agree actually, you know, and there are people who I know who I have relationships with over time, some of which actually I worked with previously and you also worked with who I, who are good sales guys and like good product knowledge guys. And I know some who are very good. Uh, you know, I know salesmen who exist in this space. The problem is, again, like you said, they are the exception and not the rule. And, and I think actually the most interesting part for regular people who aren't necessarily familiar with this topic is probably to explain to them why that actually exists. Right. So um, there, there's probably a handful of reasons, and I, I think everybody's going to kind of have their own opinion on it. But for me, the main, the main couple of reasons, one, a lot of times as a car salesman, that's your entry level to the automotive industry. Um, I, and full disclosure, I sold cars for a year or so. Uh, I was pretty good at it. I was also 19 and stupid. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, car salesmen probably have, at least at the dealer group that I worked at, had the access to the most amount of training as far as like, how to sell and how to do their job. But what happens is they have quotas, right? So you have to sell X number of cars in a two, three, four month period. If you don't, one of two things happens, at least the group that I worked in, either you got fired uh, or they would move you to another brand. So you never really develop this time. I mean, it takes time in a brand to really learn the intricacies, intricacies, that was the right word, intricacies of this. I mean, just think about it as simple as, uh, an older Mark Ford GLS and a GLX, right? Or a Pack One and a Pack Two when the the Mark Fives came out, which I still don't care. I have no clue. Trim. I literally yeah, have care. no idea. <laughs> zero zero care about that. But like as a salesperson, it's your job to know that to be able to explain to a customer, hey, here's this. Hey, here's this. A lot of times the brand puts out average information at best, and oftentimes it is far uh, later than a lot of the enthusiasts get. Because I think one of, the, one of the other issues that we get caught up in is a lot of people in our communities are those really hardcore enthusiasts. So they know more about this R32, which by the way, has no engine. Yeah, I see it's you right took down it out there today. on the floor. Um, they're gonna know more about it than a car salesman ever will because that's their passion, that's their livelihood. They're also spending $30,000 on a car. And in a way, a salesman can't know all that because honestly, they just don't care about the car as much <laughs> as a lot of people do. Not only that, if you're working at a new car dealership, you need to know your entire product line in and out, right? And you kind of have to know a bit about everything else because you're comparing it to all these things. So you, you tend to develop a broader knowledge and less deep where us enthusiasts that, that are passionate about our brand, whatever it may be, we go deep, right? We don't care about what... Ford is doing. We care about our brand all the way down the rabbit hole and like the turnover rates pretty high too. So like that doesn't help at all. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, I agree with everything you said, except for, I feel like you're being way, way too nice about it. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I think that there, the one thing I will say that, that I think a lot of people who are, if somebody's watching this, who's a fan of ours and has discovered us through the the normal channels that most people know us through is there are things that most people expect you and I to know and even come up to us at different places and expect us to know that it, we're, like there's no fucking way I would know that. And, and the reality is because the, the people underestimate the depth of knowledge required for everything. And so they'll just be like, Hey, this wire on this thing, does it do this? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like if you're diagnosing a car, you get a hey wiring man. diagram. Hey man, my car's making a noise. Can you tell me what it is? Yeah, like, no, I can't. And, and you really, and, and I, I feel, you know, I, I get mixed up a little bit in this sometimes because I do get that question so often. My car's doing this, what's wrong with it? Well, 
I try to be very upfront and honest and we're, I know we're shifting gears a little bit and we'll get back to trashing salesmen very, very, very soon. <laughs> Don't worry, the trashing is coming. But uh, to that point though, you're expected to know these things and you just, you can't know the entire thing. And sometimes you're being asked a question that's so specific to one individual vehicle in one individual state of being and you're not there, there's just no way, there's no way that you can know all this. Yes. You so that I think for sure is one of the problems. And so it, there is a uh, connection between the enthusiast, especially with the th enthusiast community where they're, they're saying, Hey, I, I know way more than this. And you don't even know the most basic version that happens. Yes. Um, but then also more importantly, when you go on to the next topic around salesman is the incentive around the knowledge uh i mean it's a vacuum there is zero incentive to have product knowledge when you're a car salesman i i mean you would almost i would say it's a negative incentive to have product knowledge because anytime you spend consuming the product knowledge things the regular person thinks hey the more you know blah blah, blah what whatever but the reality is that the car sales process as a general whole doesn't actually really require that much product knowledge because most people aren't even educated enough on, on the product knowledge to even identify that you don't know what you're talking about. Well, and, and the whole, you, 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 you're right. And they don't need it because the product is there. So you can kind of fake it and go, oh yeah, look at uh, this visor that does this. And we live in an age today that if you go shopping for a car, and you, you as customer do not have some level of knowledge of this vehicle, you are being very irresponsible with your money and your time. There is no damn excuse why as a customer, you go into that building looking for a car that you don't already have a group of knowledge about that vehicle. To me, that says the salesman needs to know even less, right? Oh yeah, well, it's highly, sure, certainly irresponsible to test drive a car and leave with a car you never intended on buying and don't know that much about. I'm sure people do it all the time, but in today's day and age, there's zero excuse. Hell, while, while you're waiting for the damn help or for them to get the dealer tag, just Google that shit on your phone real quick. Right. You know, and, and I want to say one more, like how I kind of empathize with salesmen a little bit. And then I, I really do want to get to trashing them because I've just known some disaster cluster jam, <laughs> horrible salespeople. Uh, you know, both recently and, and long ago, is they kind of, it's going to be heavy handed coming from the service and parts department. But if you pull yourself out of that and you look at what they do, those fools work an awful lot. They are often there very late. People take advantage of that. Hey, if I go in at the end of the day, I'll get a better deal because this dude wants to go home to his family. Yeah, asshole, just like you do when you want when it's time for your store to close too. Um, uh, so like they they do they're there oh, a lot. They work a lot. The hours are brutal. It's they, what they they do a ton of shit that they don't get paid for. Um, and it so, is yeah, just like I, for people who aren't familiar, car salesmen pretty much only get paid based off of the cars they sell. So the reason, again, the reason why product knowledge isn't incentivized is because the, they're only getting paid based on the models they sell and they, all they care about is closing a deal instead of actually knowing what they're talking about. And frankly, the turnover rate is generally so high that you're, there's no employee retention. And keep in mind, I just want to preface this with, this is going to be, the average to below average dealer group. Some dealer groups probably have, do a very good job of, of employee retention um, and, uh, and training properly or incentivizing training in some way that requires product knowledge. The problem is they're there to move metal. And the, and the reality is if they're not moving metal, then they don't really care, which is ultimately the problem with the entire process as a whole. Uh, but you know, and that's, that is both a critique and defense of car salesmen in the sense that um, people respond to incentives. That's human nature. And the reason why car salesmen do all these things that people hate them for is because that's what kind of the direction they're pushed in to actually do. Yeah, they, they, you know, you have 
your minimum you got to hit or you're going to get fired. That's a lot of damn stress on someone, right? And oftentimes for management, the attitude comes, boy, we started off like wanting to bash salesmen. I feel like we're just standing up for them. <laughs> like, well, this took a weird turn. Don't worry, we'll get there. Um, but, you know, when you're told hey, if you don't sell 12 cars this month, you're fired. Oh, and you suck so bad. If you don't want to be here, go on. I'll find someone else that'll, that'll do these things. Well, yeah, like what the hell kind of mental state do you think you're going to be in? I, I have a story actually I wanted to tell on this that I think is, uh, it encapsulates uh, what happens in dealerships pretty well. Uh, I worked at a place where a GM came in and he was really trying to impress people with how amazing he was. And, and he was very, uh, very much the attitude of like, show people how powerful and strong you are. And so, and you know, they were going through all this fucking bullshit training stuff they do and whatever. And their idea was, we don't want any weak players on our team. So fuck weak players. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, every month, we're going to fire the bottom performer in sales. Jeez. Now, you could imagine what happens in that circumstance. So we had a guy who um, had worked at our dealer for a long time. I don't know how long at the time. Let's just call it more than four years, five years, six years, seven years. I don't know, something like that. Um, and he was a amazing product knowledge guy. Everybody went to him for product knowledge stuff, uh, was involved. Another reason why you don't necessarily want to be the one with all the product knowledge because right. everyone comes and bothers you for it instead of learning it themselves. Right. So instead of selling cars, he's out there helping people with product knowledge shit and, and wasting his time while he's not getting paid and not selling cars. Um, <laughs> which ultimately, uh, you'll see where this heads. Uh, so he, he en ends up being this person who is the product knowledge guy, but also on top of that, he got paid some in inconsequential amount of money to like check in cars and deal with a bunch of inventory related stuff, um, related to sales and whatever else. And at the end of the month, he ends up on the bottom and they say, Oh, well, who cares if it was that guy or how long he's been here or else what else he does or whatever. And they fire him and they're fucked. The dealership eventually ends up slowly kind of deteriorating uh, uh, into a bad situation in sales, which I can't imagine why when you fire somebody who's your most loyal employee, um, regardless of whether or not they are the guy who crushes sales, uh, there should be other factors in, in, into it. And the reality is that he was not, He's not a what, you know, in the car sales business would be a 18 or 20 car a month guy, but not everybody's an A player. Well, and not everybody's an A player solely based on the number of cars they, they sell. You know, you, you have your guys that like, for me, I was very rarely the top hour turner in the shop, but that doesn't mean I wasn't one of the most important people in the building. Right. Correct, right. Same thing with salespeople. There's the guy that, yeah, he's a 12 car a month, which may be an, an average, depending on obviously the dealership or, or whatever. Maybe he's a 12 car a month, but he's the one that when you need an extra bump to a customer to, to make a decision, he can do that. Or he fills in for the sale. Like there's a million and a half things. Um, and, and I do think that the majority of the problem that salesmen face comes from poor leadership above directly in the building, um, perhaps in their dealer group, if they work for a dealer group. And then the brand, like the brands set these stupid, unrealistic expectations, regardless of what's going on in the world. They give you these bullshit surveys in, uh, that they pretty much only use to hold back money from you. And if you're not perfect, right? If you get dinged on a survey because the customer got lost coming to your dealership, uh, then you don't get your incentive for that month, which is, which is just absolutely stupid. It's, I just have they, to say, they set them up, to, they set them up to fail is, is essentially what it is. And the ones that don't fail, uh, some are great. A lot of them are crooks and don't care and just want to get customers in and out or they do shady shit to their other salesmen and steal, steal uh, deals from them and crap like that. They get promoted to management and they're, they should have no business managing anybody, let alone a group of people trying to sell stuff. Uh, or, you know, a lot of them that are good, like a handful of friends of ours, they move up to a corporate job in the brand. 
Yeah. Uh, I have to say, this is going way different than I expected so far. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So with all that defense, which I think is, is rightfully so, because we know a bunch of people who probably uh, deserve better. And frankly, you know, one of my best friends um, has a similar kind of path to you and I in terms of his original background. And then he went into sales, did well in sales and dealer groups and a variety of different brands and whatever. Um, and then now works at a, uh, a brand in corporate, but it, you know, the hours, you know, this guy, he has got a family and whatever. And so, you know, walked away because of the hours and whatever, and he was in management and dealerships. Um, and he always crushed it, but now let's talk about, uh, some of the, some of the downsides, I guess, or, or terrible experiences or terrible relationships with dealers. I mean, for me, the problem is that the incentives created create the scenario that make the worst humans on the planet veer this direction towards sales. <laughs> you're, you're not wrong. You're, I mean, you're not wrong at we're all. We're talking about people with like gambling problems, alcohol addiction, sex addiction, all, maybe all of the above combined together, frankly. Yeah, we had more than one instance where um, we had salesmen drunk on the job like not like i went to lunch and had a beer and like you know you can smell it on their breath like can't damn stand up drunk right crush the fifth of vodka yeah drunk. like yeah talking to customers and like you walk by you're like damn dude you stink it's 10 o'clock in the morning it, what the hell it is certainly not the norm that that happens. I, I can't say I've identified it ever happening. I didn't work in, uh, well, I actually, fun fact, I did work in sales part-time while I was a technician just because I wanted to try it out. So on nights on a, nights and weekends, a handful of times, I tried it out. Um, did not, I was not set up for success and I didn't care for it. Uh, but uh, But yeah. I, I did try my hand in sales for a short time. Yeah. And I think, I think why you end up sort of with this bad group or bad batch of salespeople is the good ones are good. So they're always upper echelon or they realize, Hey, I'm good at selling stuff. Right. I feel like if you're a good salesperson, what you're selling, as long as you believe in it to some capacity, you can sell and you can do very, very well. And the automotive industry has never been the uh, gold standard for treatment of its employees or, uh, or pay for that matter. So you have the really good salespeople like, F this, I'm going to go sell canoodler valves and make like three times more money and work a nine to five job. Well, so why would I? Certainly if you're good at sales, if you're very good, but that, uh, here's what I'll say. There are people who are good at sales who can't really hold down the real sales jobs that hold on to specialty type sales or whatever within certain industries. Uh, because, and th those would have probably the better hours along with them or whatever. But it does, the problem is the volume of people required to do the job exceeds the talent pool of uh, ethical people who exist within the market. <laughs> that's an unfortunate truth. Uh, and, and I think that's ultimately the problem is that the, not to mention, and, and this is something that I know is true is because salespeople, car salespeople are so hated, like universally fucking hated that people don't do it just because of that. I mean, it's just like with mechanics. Everyone you meet, if they don't directly, they're like next step, wife, husband, best friend, mom, sister, has a bad mechanic story. Right. Oh, they've been Everybody completely meet, fucked over by somebody. Oh, totally. Totally. Right. Like just brutal. Everyone you meet or their next one over has a bad car, like has a bad car salesman experience. I... I'm actually pretty fortunate, I feel like, that for most of my working life, 
I worked at a dealership. And even then there were some of those dudes that I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a damn candy bar or Girl Scout cookies from, let alone buy a car. And How about this? I have, <laughs> this is a good shitting on car salesman situation. I have worked in dealerships that I've been in, in management at that I tried to talk to sales people about sales manager. This is when now we're talking about like manager to manager about buying a car from them. And then they give me details about it. And then, then I look into it and they're actively trying to fuck me. I believe that. I believe yeah. that a similar, similar thing happened to me, not at my direct dealer, but at a dealer in the group. And I finally, I'm like, look, the dealer group has an employee price. Why are we even doing this shit? Like, this should have been the easiest sell you've had ever. And I should have been gone like three hours ago. Why are we dicking this back and forth? But to be manager to manager is ultra effed up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that happens because the reality is that when, the, when it's a new manager every 60 to 90 days, they don't give a fuck. I mean, <laughs> this is so hard for people to understand is that I, in, in management in dealerships, I sat in meetings, you know, because obviously you have dealership meetings that exist. And I don't know how many management meetings you ever sat in once you got into the uh, shop management level stuff. But they all said the same thing every, every month is like every month you talk about like the business you're going to do and blah, 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 and whatever else, your projections and why and whatever else. And every month, the, some new fucking asshole would come in. And he would say, we're going to sell this many cars, whatever the number is. Let's, let's say it's 150. We're going to sell 150 cars this month. Uh, okay, cool. Last month, you guys sold 80 cars. <laughs> but he's going to shift the paradigm. Can you explain how the fuck you're going to sell that many more cars in one month? Uh, and that question never really got pressed because nobody actually wanted to press that question because they would, it would just be like deer in headlight situation. Uh, on occasion, it would be asked. It's almost never asked. And they allowed them to continue to just, uh, just blow shit up someone's ass until the next asshole comes in. Right. Well, that's probably how that sales manager got to that position uh, to begin with. And you know that that management of that dealership talking and listening to that salesman, they don't, or that sales manager, they don't want to hear the truth. I don't know. That's how the hell I'm going to do it. I'm going to sell 90 cars. Well, you need to sell 120 cars. And I get it. Like you don't want to set the target, the bar too low, but dude. I always like, joke with my buddy that uh, the, the, uh, the answer, always a response to that is like, okay, cool. How are you going to, how are you going to do that? You know, whatever. And it's like, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to dig down real deep. We're going to make sure we get every lead and then we're going to, we're not going to let them go. We're going to make sure we get every deal done. And so it's like, that's it. It's just fucking get every problem deal solved. Just Dude, get every you, deal done. If you, you get every it. deal done, you, uh, you have it. Also like, uh, if you work in a more synergistic way, a holistic, organic uh, conversation with your customers, you'll definitely shift the paradigm. Also insert whatever other bullshit corporate nonsensical buzzword you want in there. Um, in these tough times, I don't know, whatever the hell you want to say, but yeah, I, 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 in a way, I really do in a way feel for the really good salesmen out there. That said, I just thought of a, a way, a perfect way to do what I set out to do today is a trash salesperson. Um, <laughs> they are, they, some of them are so just ripe with misinformation that it bore, like, it's not just like, oh, I didn't realize this car was gray and not silver when you call on the phone. It's flat out lying about how financing works. Financing works this way. I don't want to get into the details of it, of course, but financing works this way. It, in fact, dealerships don't do this, blah, 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 blah. And I'm, I'm reading this. This is recent. And I'm reading this post by the salesperson. I'm like, uh, that, that is, that is a, a, a lie. Like, that is 100% not true. It would essentially be the equivalent of saying that um, if when you go into the finance office to sign your like loan paperwork, whatever, and they try to sell you an extended warranty, it would be the equivalent of saying that the dealership didn't make money on that extended warranty. What? Which, if you believe that. That's their fucking job. 
yeah, that's why finance managers make like 150 grand a year because they're good at selling that shit. And I'm not saying like yeah, sometimes extended warranty is great. Um, they are. Like they legit, this, I legitimately recommend them for a lot of different people. Not everybody, but if, some if you're buying a European car, that's probably the best damn money you could spend. Um, especially if it's not a brand new car, <laughs> it's a used car. It's yes. probably the best money. But anyway, um, like that was the information being put out by the salesman. And I'm, I'm reading this and I tell my wife, I'm like, honey, listen to this shit. And she's like, well, that doesn't sound right. I'm like, it's not, it's flat out wrong. And she's like, are you going to say anything? I'm like, I don't think I should. Like, it's going to expose this whole thing. And it probably wouldn't have like four people might've cared, but I'm just like, you, you flat out fucking lied. You might believe that bullshit, but that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. See, to me, what I always found was that salespeople, salespeople never care enough to actually learn the nuance of anything. Why would they, if they don't sell 12 cars, they're, they're out. Correct. And that's, but, but it's not even just that. It's that the people who tend to be salespeople, and again, we're not talking about the people who are on the good ones, uh, the 10% probably. Uh, you think it's that high? Uh, <laughs> I actually do think it's probably I think about it's that. probably about that high, actually. So it's probably almost exactly 10% of them. So just to be clear, we're not defending salespeople. We're only defending 10% of the salespeople, <laughs> which is yeah. only, just to be clear, one for every 10 you've ever met which is yeah. a very low amount because the other one's probably Sad. with a customer <laughs> when, when you got there. Sad. Yeah. Sad. The good one was selling a car when you just happened to stroll up to the dealership. Yeah, yeah. you oh, met the, the, the ninth fucking asshole. Uh, oh. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I just think they don't care to understand the nuance of anything. And I can tell you because when we got into tuning, oh my, oh my, oh my. You know, obviously dealers, for anybody not familiar, Tuning cars was always something that dealers were terrified to be involved with because they're afraid about Volkswagen going after them, blah, 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 whatever, this and that. Um, when it happened, I was not the first to bring tuning to dealerships, but I was one of the first, um, one of a handful of, of dealers to be the first to do tuning. And probably the first one that was really out there publicly in the, little, in the public eye because I did a lot of Vortex stuff and whatever else. Um, we had salespeople who be, they would be like, uh, is this uh, so this is just under warranty because you guys are doing it. It's like, and they'd be like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like, yeah. You get caught explained. up in that. Like you just tell the customer whatever they want to hear. Right. That and covered. I, sure. Will you take care of this after sale? Hell yeah. We'll fix that scratch. Oh, no problem. We, we wouldn't even consider it if, it, if there was any other concerns. And it's just like, yeah, that's not what I explained to you, but clearly you didn't listen to it anything i fucking said because that's not what i said <laughs> that's what they heard though right that's what you tell heard it's like tell yeah, the customer what they want to hear but can i tell them it's under warranty and then pretend like i'm stupid when when things don't work out quite that way and it's be like sorry yeah. i work at a mitsubishi dealership now well and, and that's like that's another problem and why that they can get away with such mediocrity is that you have this system set up at a dealership where they're like if, monkeys that swing from tree to tree. Well, if the salesman says something stupid, like, yeah, it'll be covered under warranty. Don't worry about it. Once this paperwork is signed, there's no accountability. Zero. I'm out. And, it's the well, sales, It's the service department's problem. Yes. Oh yeah. I didn't show you how that GPS shit worked. Take it back to service. They'll show you. Oh, it's probably broken. It's under warranty technician will take care of it you know what let me get that technician up here and let him explain my fucking job to you yeah so <laughs> the, right, that one's a, <laughs> that happened the, a lot yeah. that shit that shit like hits me hard that happened a lot what what just hit charles in the feels that <laughs> we didn't really explain real well uh there's a very common problem in in salesmen to pass the buck off to the back whether it be service or parts to uh, deal with the nuance and the explanation of something that they never, they never, because they don't care to understand, they don't give a shit. They just yes people to death and then send everybody out back because those are the people who actually understand about cars. So 
the best people to talk to who understand cars is probably technicians, then parts don't, people and service yeah. advisors. I was going to say, don't, don't you dare say service advisors. <laughs> parts people, probably, probably <laughs> technicians, parts people, Janitors. service Service of well, wow. <laughs> service <laughs> detail <laughs> department, service advisor, guy at the gas station down the street. No, then I'm, I'm then there, I actually had some really great service. No, advisors. there are some great ones. Uh, and, there's some garbage and, ones who are yeah. basically salespeople, part two. Uh, yeah, Oof. yeah, it's just worse when there's the salespeople part two because it's not only that their income that they got to worry about, but it's you know, four other people, four other technicians that are relying on them being good. Uh, well, they're good. They just they just make uh, very mad people. Is usually the situation with them. But yeah. Uh, but the pass the buck culture is is spot on. I mean, once once the the paperwork's signed and the deal's done and the survey comes through, right? The salesmen they're out. Well, there's no accountability. I'm, I'm that, but yeah. that's a that is a management problem. That is a hundred percent. As somebody who manages people, you know, obviously I have a fair number of employees now people will do things and to try to get away with it because they don't, it's not easy for them, right? It sucks. They don't have to deal with it, whatever. And the reality is if you let them get away with it over and over again, they're going to continue to do it. Why wouldn't they? Right. Why wouldn't they? That's human nature. So, so when you don't hold somebody, somebody accountable to, to take care of a customer and follow through on your promise, you know, to me, you, it, Every if if I'm in uh, if I'm a general manager of a dealership, every sales promise, I'm gonna put the sales manager's balls in a fucking vice, and make him accountable to every sales promise that ever exists. That way, he doesn't let all these shitbirds who come in here promise the world to everybody and piss off customers and make them hate our dealership. Yeah, that uh, that's me. But I care about no, branding, no, no, so you know, like, <laughs> I don't get to have some random logo that draws customers into my business. So you know, no, that uh, you know that. It, and what's what's really fascinating to me is that you know we're having this conversation in 2020 when, let's be honest, and Tesla has has in many ways proven this among among other. Uh, among other companies like Carvana and uh, probably some other ones out there too, is the need for a car salesman today, dude, if you do it right, is damn zero. Uh, damn zero. So here's what I'll say. I agree. Test, that is a job that will eventually be completely obsolete. I don't even know why it was, exists anymore. There's there's a model... Uh, the guy I knew who's kind of an asshole, but it's kind of a funny thing. It was like of uh, what he called Velcro, Velcro sneaker car salesman, which is basically people who are so stupid they couldn't even tie their shoes. <laughs> I love that. I love um, that. Can I, can, do you think he'd mind if I borrow that term? Yeah, Cause no, it's perfect. You can pretty much incorporate it into any, any uh, role. And essentially the idea is, is that, you would have salespeople who basically just show people the car. You give them the car, you test drive with them, whatever. And then the sales manager works the deal, which I actually, funny enough, before you, we did this, I talked to my buddy who now works in corporate, who was in sales for a long time. And now he's got even more different views because he now sees corporate from a higher level and sees different dealerships he's dealing with. And I said, do you have any dealerships who are implementing uh, the what, what I call the Velcro sneaker? Uh, process and and he said there are and some of them are very successful and the reason why they're successful is because they're very process driven and so they hold they have extreme accountability because they don't allow all the fucking bullshit to happen i'm sure and the, so you can hire the velcro sneaker salesman who don't know anything they just like oh yes sir let's show you the car with the silver yeah, car with the smiling pretty face that is nice and accommodating and it's like when you had a really great waitress at the restaurant that you know maybe they didn't know the menu really well but they were awesome and they were nice and it made your dining experience pleasant correct and that's kind of the same idea is is it's you're not getting the uh sommelier of wine who's giving you all the fucking tannins and bullshit and whatever uh, if you're a wine douche and you like all that. <laughs> but you're getting like, hey, have a good dinner experience, yeah. you know, you're, kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, I actually prefer, in fact, when we, we bought our Torag, 
Um, I, I went to the dealership. It was at a non VW dealership. I went to the dealership and, uh, talked to the guy and he's like, he starts his, his thing, right. Which good on him for following what was probably their process. And I stopped him. I'm like, look, dude, this is going to sound harsh, but we can go one of two ways with this. This is either going to be not a sale or it's going to be legit the easiest money you ever make in your entire life because they do, they're there to do a job. They should be compensated for it. I really think, uh, I'm like, I know more about this car than you do. So don't try and sell me on anything on this car. You're going to get the keys. We're going to go on a test drive. I'm either going to like the car or not. If I like the car, I'm going to tell you I like the car and I want to buy it. Then I want you to go to your sales manager and right out of the gate, I don't want to screw around. I don't want to beat around the, I don't want to do this back and forth bullshit. Go get me the price you're going to sell me this car for best price you can do. I want you to make your money on it. I know the dealership's got to make any, their money on it and come back to me. If you do that, I will write you a check and I will leave out of here with this car today. If you don't do that, I'm out. Well, I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> no, to stop overthinking this shit. Go do what I need you to do. You're essentially my secretary at this point and let's get this deal done and I'll go home and you sell a car and not even have to do any damn work. This is win-win. It worked out. Not quite that easy, but I was yeah. going to say, what, what's your general opinion of buying a car? Uh, it depends on the car. I would say, you know, again, like from a dealer, ma- from a used ma- dealer or a new dealer, what doesn't matter. Same shit. The majority of my life I've had, I've just been really, really spoiled. Cause it's like, I want to buy that one. And it was there and it was like, I'll just sign the paperwork at work, but I don't necessarily like it. Um, I like a little bit of that gamesmanship of trying to get like the best deal and playing around mentally with a a weak salesman. I think that can be kind of fun. Uh, But if I could go online and feel like I was getting a a decent deal and click and like a Tesla or a Carvana have that shit delivered to my house, I would do that every single time rather than having to go deal with a bunch of dumb shit. So I, I completely agree every, so this is the way I preface every car I buy from a, from a used or new dealer is I say, listen, I'm going to buy a car. I don't know if it's going to be from you. And I give you, I give them the background and say, here's my background. I've been in dealerships my whole life. I'm obviously very familiar with the car buying process. I don't want fucking bullshit. And obviously, you know, I'm from New Jersey. I can be what some may describe as rough around the edges. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so because of that, it's like, Hey, listen, I want to be upfront. I really, I don't want to waste time. That's for me. That's my biggest thing is I just don't like, I hate the process of the bullshit and back and forth. I know some people like that, that gamesmanship of like trying to negotiate the best deal. I don't, I don't like it. I don't want to be a part of it. I just want what I, what I consider to be a fair price. I expect a dealership or any place to make money on the thing they're selling to me hundred percent. Nobody fucking is in business to not make money. I expect you to make money. Cool. Give me a fair price on what I think is a a fair product. I will buy it. I will leave. You will get to make money. We all end happy. Yeah. We don't need to drag this out for five damn days. We can get this shit done in two hours because I don't want to be here anymore. Correct. Totally feel that. Now, to be fair, I don't step foot in a dealership until I've already negotiated the price. I don't do it. I don't want to do it. I don't care to do it. It's because it's too much time. It's fucking seven hours or some bullshit. Oh. It's, it's ridiculous. You know, it's, it's whatever it is. It sucks. I and, remember being a kid, man. And like when my folks would buy a car, it would be like four days in a row. We would have to be up at that damn dealership, probably over like $35 or some dumb shit like that. Like, dude, you could have just, stayed at work late five minutes and made $200. Why are you here doing this? This is stupid to me. Um, but it'd be like days at the days. I mean, it, even when you worked at the dealership, dude, when I worked at the dealership, you'd see people come in at like nine 30 in the morning and you're getting ready to leave at six and they're still damn there. Like what the hell you took the day off to come here. Nothing. Nothing we're doing here should take a whole day. Like yes. two hours 
is a long time to be there in my opinion. Yes, I, I right? completely agree. Which is why when I buy a car, everything's negotiated before I walk in the door. Rate is negotiated. The fucking, the price is negotiated. The rate is negotiated. Everything's done. The financing, you have my credit app, you have all my bullshit, whatever, ahead of time. There is no like whatever. And, and even still, with all that said, all that upfront, all that prefacing, they still fucking jerk me around. Now, that's the shit that makes me go insane. And obviously, I'm not happy with when it happens. But that's the stuff that happens in very often in that buying process that is like, there's no reason for this. We've already talked about price. We've already talked about rate. There's no reason to try to fucking jam some bullshit in me behind it in, in, you know, in F and I or whatever to try to come after me to try to make sure I'm not on my toes. Yeah. I, I, there are a few companies that have really simplified the process and you know, the big, the big, I worked at CarMax when I sold cars. So like a lot of people say it's not real car sales, but it is whatever. I got paid the same no matter what. So my only job was to find like my, my opinion of what my job was, was look, you're here. You didn't come here just to screw around, came here to buy a car. My job is to help you find the best fit for you, right? I don't care what it is, uh, whether it's a Lincoln whatever or a Ford Escort or whatever the hell. Like, I don't give a shit. I get paid the same amount of money. So I'm here to help you find what's right for you. And there was a point to that that has uh, escaped. That, well, so, that, that's uh, the oh, one hey, thing this, I say. This Go is ahead. what it was. Like, there are companies that have simplified down that buying process so much to – you click the one you want on the website, it comes down the vending machine and you get it delivered. And a lot of people talk shit about that saying, well, you're going to pay more money or you're going to get screwed. Like maybe, but what the hell's like, how do you, how do you gauge that? Right. Yeah. I don't I even know how you gauge that information based on what, based on what the used car store where every car is the fucking same, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it's another dick measuring contest of man. I talked that sales guy down another $300, bro. You spent four fucking days doing it. Congratulations. Yeah, You're not making any sense with that. Yeah, Go back to work per hour more worth. money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, that well that's, that's the difference of people who are self-employed who the way they think versus people who are not self-employed uh <laughs> is when you when you are you think about your dollars per hour a little bit differently but uh yeah the the to me i i've i've said for probably nearly a decade now that the car buying process needs to be changed because so many people hate it that I don't see how it could continue. And the problem is, is that I, I think ultimately, you know, I think CarMax had the right idea. Um, I just think the problem is it's so hard to get your message out there that they couldn't actually connect with the market to allow them to actually do it. Like, well, I think CarMax really totally, they totally had they could have owned the online car buying business and they, they jumped on it early. Cause I worked there in like 99 and I remember when they moved the very first guy from traditional sales to online sales and he did pretty well. There's no reason why they couldn't have owned that market. It's like blockbuster totally whiffing on the movie thing, right? They should, they should be what Netflix and prime and what is that box um, that's like outside the grocery store Red where box. you could get a DVD? Red box. I they can't believe that exists that anymore. It, does it? I don't. I don't know. I don't I, go to stores. It and... does, I think, but I can't <laughs> imagine that anybody who uses Red box anymore. What is I this? I don't know. If you use Red box, let us know in the so, comments because I've actually never 12? rented from. Uh, I think Walmart has it, so maybe that it's like you know a kid's birthday parties or or something like that. That's definitely do, not a thing. <laughs> I don't know. Like if again, if I could. If I could just order one, like I order shit from Amazon, I would be, I would be happy to do that. Interesting dynamic, actually worth, worth discussing during this, since we're talking about buying cars or whatever. Uh, and you mentioned Tesla. So Tesla, uh, interesting dynamic that Tesla did. So I don't think you and I ever talked about this, but it's worth talking about here is Tesla's used car buying process. So 
Tesla has a lot of used cars listed on their website, tesla.com, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You can buy used cars, this and that. And I know Rich, who you know, uh, who I don't know, has had, had done a video about a Model X he was trying to buy, a used Model X he was trying to buy from Tesla direct on their, from their website. And he asked a bunch of questions about it, as many used car buyers have and blah, blah, blah. And they didn't have any answers. Eventually, he decided to buy it anyway. And he did so. Ordered the car, took him many, many, many months to get it and with a lot of problems and then only come to receive the vehicle. Um, and it had like all four wheels were curbed up. XYZ was a problem, this and that, whatever. Now, what I had realized during that time is that Tesla was listing cars directly from auto auctions. <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. Wow. So the car that he bought, and I, and I know this because I actually commented on his video from, from our YouTube channel, was, was the car he bought was being sold at Mannheim. Now, for those who don't know who Mannheim is, you feel free to Google them. They're the largest used car auction, used car auctioneur in the US. And they basically sell every used car that exists for the most part to every dealership you probably ever bought one for unless they got traded in. Yeah, so um, that's something that like, I, I don't know that, that people necessarily realize. When you go to a car dealership that sells new VWs, for example, they have a certain number of used cars on the lot, right? And just the majority of them, or I don't know, like whatever the percentage is, right? Some of them were direct trade-in. Some of them were off lease. Customer turned their lease back in and didn't buy another car. A lot of them do come from an auction house where we are. Most of them come from Carolina Auto Auction. But Mannheim, which I think is up in the Northeast somewhere, maybe? Yeah, Pennsylvania is where Mannheim um, is based out of. They have more than one auction. auction but that's yeah. where the majority of those that, like a dealer gets a car on trade or off lease and they don't necessarily want it. It's a, it's a Mercedes dealer and a Kia comes in off lease and they don't want to deal with selling a Kia. So they send it to Mannheim or, or some other auction house. Correct. So, thousands of cars. Yes. Thousands. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of cars. So the majority of the, the used cars that come through dealerships in the market probably come through Mannheim. And so what Tesla was doing was listing Mannheim cars with, by the way, with Mannheim pictures. <laughs> and Tesla markup. And Tesla markup. Yes, it could be clear. A significant markup with and and you know this, but they the the average viewer won't with no recon. Oh my gosh. Zero that, fucking yeah. recon because you haven't even taken ownership of the car. And just to be clear, what that means is that Tesla is listing a car they've never seen, inspected, or verified to be a good vehicle. They're listing it on their website for sale as a as a Tesla vehicle without having ever touched it, which means the customer could have taken a shit in the driver's seat right before they fucking traded it in. And you and might be buying seen, the car. Having seen some cars from auction, <laughs> that is not like, that may sound like a ridiculous It's example. not that crazy. It is not that crazy because I have seen some just nasty ass cars. I don't think I've ever seen like an actual like, pile of shit in a seat thankfully but i it w i wouldn't surprise me if okay me like yeah, okay heavens. now worst car you've ever seen service drive or otherwise worst car you've ever seen what was it oh my god i i <sighs> bro there has to be one that stands out i, I have a few that stand out but one for sure i think the beetle was a customer's car the beetle with the boogers so like you know when you're sitting in your seat and you have like your your driver's seat and you have your butt, the lower bolster. This was a pick and wipe on the lower bolster. And the only reason I saw this, cause that's not like a common place that you look as a technician, unless you're taking the seat out, is we had in-ground lifts in our shop. So you could, it was great. You could raise the car up with the, the doors wide open. And I had the, the car like eye level with the doors open and I walk up and I'm like, what the hell is that on the, oh my God, that's boogers. 
And so I had to call my service advisor and she almost threw up. It was great. It was just a little like tiny picture. I'm sure there was other gross ass. That's the worst one you've seen? Probably not, but that's just the one I can think of. I've blocked a lot of that out. The Mm. worst one I've seen. I've seen two that come to mind that were the worst ones. I did think of another one though. So Okay, go, go, go. No, 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 no. Go tell yours. Tell yours. I'll tell one and then I'll tell one more. So I'll go, then you go. Okay, so first one that comes to mind. We had a Torag. Torag was... Is that where it stops? We had a Torag. <laughs> that's the end of it. Every Torag. Uh, <laughs> this Torag was filled to the windows. Now, keep in mind, this is an SUV all the way. And I'm saying passenger seat to trunk filled with trash all the way up to the window sills on every place. The back seat, the trunk, the passenger seat, and part of the driver's seat was filled with trash to the point where like and we're talking about like we're not talking about like like oh some paper you crumped up crumpled up and threw in the passenger seat we're talking about like your fucking disgusting arby's meal that you ate part of it and then just threw it on the floor times 77 wow like uh how do how do you up to the fucking windowsills the entire car People are insane. So, okay, then I so one my, more to go with that one. So this one was actually one of our loaner cars that a customer had, and uh, that you know they're getting their car worked on. So they were borrowing a dealership car. They came and got their car, left the shop car. Uh, car sat there a couple of days before it kind of went through like getting washed and and whatnot. And uh, they opened the door to move it around to get it washed. And the car just had this horrible, horrible smell, like punched in the face awful smell when they open the door so they like open the car up they're letting it air out trying to figure out where the smell comes is coming from they open the trunk they don't really see anything in the trunk they for whatever reason just like hunting for the smell they pulled up i want to say this was like a b6 passat so like a 2006 2007 passat um may have been a wagon i don't know they pull up the carpet in the trunk and what had happened the customer went grocery shopping spilled a gallon of milk oh didn't clean it up the car sat and i'm gonna just assume this was the summertime so in the carolina heat for a couple of days well instead of just filling the trunk well which wouldn't be good but it's not the end of the world when she was driving it the milk went through underneath the back seat rest and there was puddles of milk underneath the back seat dude there was like maggots and shit growing in Uh. it and like they had to replace a whole bunch of shit in this car i don't know that they ever even got to smell it i refused to work on it i know like i have I, i wouldn't like i don't care how much you pay i ain't doing that shit that that might be the grossest like there was creatures living under the seat it was pretty that nasty. that sounds like the worst like actual smell yeah. like not humans who did gross shit but like just smell yeah i don't i don't i was i was involved in it in a manner in which i didn't have to do any work on it so i was happy i did ha- i will say that reminds me of a time which is unrelated to the other gross thing i'm about to say but uh this is another gross thing. We had a, a uh, this was fortunately, I was in my fair infancy at a dealership, but I was not uh, the low man on the totem pole per se. The service manager who drove from far away from a more rural area in our area, in the Charlotte area, ran over a dead deer on his way into work. Ugh. And in the process, he said, hey, uh, I hit this dead deer while I was on my way. I just want to make sure everything's okay. And so the, the FNG or the fucking new guy was, was tasked with looking over the vehicle to verify there weren't any problems. Now, when he pulled it in, it was on a four, we had a four post lift. He pulled it in and he lifted it up and there were hunks of deer hanging from from multiple pieces oh, God. on the car 
<laughs> some That's of which be like hey boss man take this thing around to detail and get this shit cleaned up <laughs> i ain't trying to work on that sorry so, detail but <laughs> some of these were like like for example the exhaust support that goes in between by like the mid muffler yeah had a large hunk of deer meat that was oh. partially cooked hanging from the from from the subframe of that uh, along with a bunch of other obviously cooked deer meat stuck to all other components in the in the vehicle, which was r- real gross, real because there's a lot of like very red bloody meat hanging from all different places on the car. Oh, that nah, nah, nah. Mm-mm-mm. It was a big yuck. Luckily, was there that one dude that was like, "Hey, man, let me get some of that deer meat." <laughs> well, we we are in North Carolina, where we—that's <laughs> why I asked. <laughs> well, so you know, it's funny. You know, I live in the Charlotte area, and where where I live, from for people who are not familiar of the area, the texture of the area, Charles and I both live in North Carolina. We both live in pretty, uh, I guess you would call urban or or uh, uh, advanced areas in north carolina we live in the two most populated areas yes in north carolina Carolina. so most of north carolina yes people think of like hillbillies and rednecks and there's plenty of that here there's just not that much where i live but when i first came to the dealership that i worked at there were guys who commuted like 45 minutes maybe an hour from a very rural place and I was, and for me being from New Jersey, I was like culture shock, like, holy shit, these people are crazy. Uh, yeah, that was an interesting experience for me. Uh, but they were, they were more on the page of, uh, of the deer meat, uh, venison. Although I've had venison. I enjoy it quite a bit, but not, not from like, not cooked, cooked underneath the door. Not quite road skill, roadkill catalyst venison. That's Ooh. not really quite my thing. Uh, the other one that I, that was notable for me is I had a, we had a customer that manual vehicle that, uh, I don't recall what they were in there for, but they had cigarette butts. This was a Mark four. Uh, if you're not familiar with Mark fours, cigarette, the cigarette ashtray is right in front of the shifter and uh it's maybe i don't know a three four inches by three inches or so hole that you can put ash you know cigarette butts and ashtrays in this was completely filled up and overflowing all around the shifter in the complete area surrounding the shifter like this with cigarette butts literally filling the shift boot all the way up and overflowing out of that into the cup holder behind it to the point where you would get in and it would just like, and to be clear at the time I used to smoke. So (laughs) if you have that, and if if you're like offended by that, I smoked a pack a day at the time. That shit's nasty. If you smoke a pack a day and you get in a car and you're like, uh, that's, that's not good. It ain't good. Oh my gosh. I, I, I feel like there's probably a thousand more cars that if I really thought hard about it, uh, I could think of just their pure, nasty, gross. Ugh. Anyway, um, I say we, we final, what, what's, what's the, uh, the parting thought on, on salesmen? Why don't we do this? Why don't we give somebody something actionable about car salesmen? Buy it online so you don't have to deal with them would be my first advice. That's my only advice. Yeah. Don't deal uh, with them. I'm out. Uh, my advice is, and this is probably uh, to, the, uh, to the chagrin of all the people I know who are car salesmen, who I said good things about earlier. Uh, my advice is make sure you educate yourself on the car buying process. Negotiate yourself as to what you should be paying relative to other vehicles of a similar ilk, uh, mileage and quality. Make sure you don't uh, sell yourself a bill of goods on either too good or too bad. Search broadly relative to the market, but also negotiate before you walk in the door. Don't, to me, walk in the door, know what you're buying before you walk, walk in the door and then decide on a price before you walk in the door. That way, 
all you're doing is going to verify the car is not a pile of shit. I trust car salesmen with their opinion of cars the same way I trust realtors with their opinion of houses, which is zero. Um, I think realtors in many ways, especially this about probably about that same percentage of bad car salesmen are even more useless than car salesmen. Um, but I think you hit it. The big, the big takeaway of what you said, I think is educate yourself on what you're buying. There is no excuse not to know roughly what you should be paying for a car. What they'll tell you is, well, Kelly Blue Book's not going to write you a check for the car or Kelly Blue Book's not going to sell you a car. And they're right. If you're buying a used car, there are plenty of other used cars out there. If you're buying a new car, there are plenty of other new cars out there. Yes. Walk away don't, is the number one rule. Have the ability to them, walk away. Absolutely. Don't let them push you into something you really don't want to do. Um, if they sell the car tomorrow, they sell the car tomorrow, right? There are very few cars that are so limited that if you don't buy that particular one, you're not going to find another one. Um, and if you are dealing in that category, then it doesn't really matter because you're probably paying more than sticker anyway. So who cares? Um, but yeah, educating yourself is definitely priority one and there's no excuse not to do it. There you have it, folks. That's an episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, give us some feedback. Do you like the this side of things, the car side of things, giving you insight, whatever? Uh, yeah. Are you disappointed in the lack of trashing of salesmen? Because I have to say, I expected there to be more. I, I feel like it was only 50%. Or so, which is low in my opinion, and re relative, they probably deserve more. But maybe we'll find that for an another episode. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So bye much bye. For bye.